Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Hey, man. Good to see all of you lovely folks. And we're so excited about what God is doing here in the midst of everybody and to hear all the testimonies. They put a smile on our face. And we're so glad that God is still at work up here in this particular region. Amen. I think the last time we were here, there was a special meeting and I think Brother Lee Ship and someone, what was Christy or Krista Johnson, a little sassy little thing, giving us all kind of problems and everything. But she, she had a good word for us, though, but praise the Lord. But my wife and I, we travel a lot. And we're always happy whenever we can get here. There's been several times that Aaron has mentioned to me about coming here in January, but our schedule never seemed to permit it. But this time worked out well because I know how much my wife enjoys coming up here, seeing you folks and hanging out with Sarah. So I just kind of yeah. planned it in conjunction with her birthday. So it would be a nice little surprise for her. <laughs> Praise God. But... I would like to just share a few more testimonies before I get into the word briefly. But when we were here last, I think it might have been May or something like that, but we left here, went back down into uh, South Central Nebraska. And of course, we passed the Revival Tabernacle in Red Cloud, King of Kings in Hebron and Gospel Lighthouse in Friend. And we had a crusade scheduled for Hayes, Kansas. Because now we hold different meetings all across North Central Kansas. And God really just moved. We, I had never been to Hayes. I'd held several crusades in a cell barn in Plainville. So I thought Hayes might have only been three or 4,000 people. But well, we got there that, that night for that first meeting for the crusade. Nearly 400 people had come out. Folks were hungry. They packed out this building and we ministered on a Friday night in evangelistic service and Saturday morning had a Holy Spirit rally. But multitudes of people came to God that Friday night and God just Amen. moved. And, and out of that, we, we left there and then we, I think we went to Mississippi or somewhere and we kept getting these phone calls and texts. People were saying, what are we supposed to do? We need a place to fellowship. So we prayed about it. And then in August, we went back down there into that area. And then we planted a new church. I had told my wife, I said, honey, we're done with churches. I said, we'll just do Bible studies and stuff. But here I was again, right in the middle of a, another church plant. So we went down into Hayes, a college town, and held that first service. And I mean, they just came from everywhere. I mean, just lots of folks in that place. We named it Family Worship Center. So there's Family Worship Center North, and now you've got Family Worship Center South. So we are so glad to be able to do what we're doing down there. So our schedule looks like this now. Sunday morning, we preach in Red Cloud. Sunday night, we preach in Hebron. Monday night, we minister in Friend. Tuesday night, back to Hebron. Wednesday night, back to Red Cloud. Thursday, we're off. Friday night, we preach our meeting in Hayes, Kansas. Saturday morning, I'm usually teaching a leadership meeting, and then the thing starts all over again. So just pray for us. We, we, I just got back, I shouldn't say just got back, several months ago I went to Kazakhstan over in Central Asia. I was invited by the Foursquare to come and minister in their Bible college. I spent four days teaching them about how to establish underground churches in Muslim territories. Those students had marvelous testimonies. There was one young lady there who raised as a Muslim had never ever seen a church in her region in her life, had never met a Christian, never seen a Bible. But I said, how did you become a believer? She said, my mother was dying and in the hospital and said, I was sitting there with her and we didn't have any hope at all, nothing to put a smile on our face. But she said, I went to sleep one night and while I was sleeping, it was like I was laying in the middle of the ocean. And she said to the left, there was a big boat and it had Islam written on it. And she said she thought it was Muhammad up there waving at her, telling her to come. 
She said she looked to her right. There was another ship, beautiful ship, had Christianity written on it. Said somebody dressed in a long white glowing robe was on top of it and was beckoning me to come. So I said, what did you do? She said, I dove in the water and swam to the boat that said Christianity. And she said, I've been a Christian ever since then. And so God is doing wonderful things for those folks over there in Central Asia. I was there for a Central Asian prayer conference. We had people from Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, all of these had come together, about 700 people, and we had interpreters so I could listen through, through the uh, earpiece. And while I was there, I just kind of had a vision as one man from Uzbekistan was telling his testimonies. And it looked like to me, I saw the ground moving around the map of, of Central Asia, almost like you have something underneath the soil and you can see the dirt moving. And it was like a snake or something like that. And then I saw that head come up and then I saw one person appear on the head of that snake and started jumping up and down. Then the one person became 10. Then the 10 became 100. Then 100 became 1,000. Then there were so many people you couldn't even see the snake anymore as they stomped it in the ground. And God spoke to my heart and said, I want you to help these people bring in a massive harvest here in Central Asia. And so we just recently started that. We're going over there helping the Kazakh people to preach the gospel. A good man that I'm working with has started over 130 house churches in that region. God is moving, folks, I'm telling you. One Uzbekistan brother told us that when he started his house church, he only had his family, but he said they started praying for the sick. He said people were coming across the border to come to his home. He said the Muslims were getting angry and jealous because of the miracles that were breaking out. People were being healed. And that little house church of his now has over 100 people coming to it as they're preaching Christ. So folks in that area, they need prayer because it's against the law for people to proselytize and to turn and go to another religion. But we had a great time. I preached in a Russian speaking service one morning. God moved in that place. Afterwards, we had a miracle service. First person got up in that line, laid hands on him. She screamed, I'm healed. Everybody jumped up, looked like they got in line. We laid hands on, I don't know how many people. Two o'clock in the afternoon as God was still healing people and people were yelling and screaming. The second service flowed over into the Kazakh speaking service. So then I had to preach the Kazakh speaking service. It all turned around and happened again at the end of that service. Never got out of church that day to about seven o'clock at night as we were ministering to people one by one, hungry folks. Anybody that'll come these great distances have a desire for God, you see. And so we praise the Lord for what we have an opportunity to do. We celebrated my 50th birthday while I was there. The Kazakh people and the students and the church people were kind enough to want to celebrate with me. So they butchered a horse. Oh, yes, they did. Yes, they did. They surprised me. I walked into that room. I'm telling you, there was 700 pounds of horse meat stretched out across these tables. You haven't seen that much horse meat in your life on the table. But we ate it. We devoured it. We loved it. And I said, praise the Lord. So, folks, don't think that around this world... People don't eat different things, but you add a little salt and pepper and Tabasco sauce, everything tastes good after a little while. <laughs> well, we come back from that trip, and then my wife and I together I took her back to East Africa to minister on the Kenya-Tanzania border. I went back to the Maasai tribe to preach to them again. Now, the Maasai tribe, these are the folks you read about in National Geographic. These are the folks still living in mud huts thatched roofs, no running water. There is no technology out there. Don't even bother to bring a cell phone. You're not going to get any kind of service out there. But I, I wondered how my wife would, would react to that because the Assemblies of God had invited me to come and preach. And I had 1,800 young adults and later teens they were out in the middle of the bush country. Now these folks had walked, some of them, 40 and 50 miles one way. Now I want you to think about that. 
40 and 50 miles one way through the bush. Some of them had nothing but sticks and spears because they live out there where you still have the wild animals and they have to protect themselves. But God poured out his spirit in those meetings. We saw hundreds of young people coming to that altar, crying out to God. They danced all over that place. They, one day they were, they were kind enough to want to wanna celebrate with me again. We've got these elders and everybody, when they butcher their water buffalo and their food and all of that, they, they, they save the choicest organs and pieces of meat for the elders and the visiting speakers. And so my wife, I think she might have had an idea some of this was coming, so she gravitated back to the only vehicle there was out there in the desert, which we came in, and they came over there and brought to me and some of the other guys, goat's liver, cow tongue, cow heart, and folks, we sat there, and I just ate with them just like I was one of the family. They were receiving the word as I was preaching it, so I didn't have a problem receiving the meat from their hands that I know that they had made. We went out further into the bush where there were people who probably had never even seen a car. And I was in a small rural church out there preaching for a pastor who's what they call a crown warrior. He's the only Maasai person in that region who had killed three lions before he was 25 years of age. You've got to understand the Maasai people, every young man, when he turns 13, he has to go live in the bush for at least 10 years and kill the five biggest animals in order to be accepted back into his tribe to prove his manhood. Oh, look at you young men in here. Oh, I can, I can see the looks on some of your faces. But yes, I, I shook the hands of these people and I thought, oh my goodness, how in the world can anybody live like this? But folks, they love the Lord. They praise God out there in the middle of that wilderness. And I was so glad to be able to have my wife with me as we looked into the eyes of other people that are part of the body of Christ. They love the king and we're praying for them often. One of them asked us if we'd be so kind to help them build a school. They said they're, they're, uh, they don't have a school at all out there, so you're dealing with illiterate people. But they want a school because the younger generation, they're wanting them to learn how to read and write. And to put up a school out there may be $1,500, $2,000 or something like that to put a steel building up there for them to congregate in. Well, they told me, they said, we need a school because our children presently, six, seven, eight, nine years of age, have to walk five kilometers, three miles or so, one way in the dark before sunrise to get to school for a couple of hours and then start making their way back. And they said, if we had our own school here in the region, we could maintain our children right here because we're losing 12 to 15 kids every year to wild hyenas when they have to get up in the morning and take that trip. So this is a world where there is no water, folks. The, the women have to walk a day's journey with buckets to get water, spend the night there, and they all go together with spears, <coughs> spears and weapons to fight off whatever wild animals are coming to the watering hole. Then the next morning, they walk all the way back. So you know how precious that water is when you get back home. You see, you're not going to be frivolous with that. So folks, all over this earth, there are people that are in need of God's help. We're doing everything we can to be a blessing to them. We know you pray for us all the time. We're so grateful for that. Now, also in Kenya on this last trip, the, the entire Foursquare Church aligned themselves with our World Ministry Fellowship and what we're doing. So I'll go back to Kenya in April. We're going to install a new bishop over that whole denomination out there. And we're going to continue to travel. I heard somebody mention Brazil. We've got friends in Brazil. We'll be, we're supposed to go there this year to visit with them. Some other friends with New Tribes Mission. So we hope to be able to catch up with them. Uh, it's looking like I'll go back to Kazakhstan again. Nigeria is calling. Just a lot of places that are calling for us right now. So please pray for it. Now, we'll let you in on this. 
A couple of friends of mine have a ministry called Light of Life International. The head of it is a gentleman named Stephen Evans. He, for many, for, for many, many months, he was the personal assistant of Reinhard Bonnke, who just recently passed away and traveled with him. Him and another gentleman named Stephen New, the vice president of this organization, are good friends of mine. They give their lives to preaching the gospel in Central America and South America. They are planning a massive crusade the third week of July of this year in El Salvador. And so they're looking for teams of young adults, people that will want to come down there and minister with them. So that'll be like a get in on a Monday, then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday is all of the street witnessing with interpreters. And they go door to door praying for people leading up to the Saturday and Sunday crusade where they're expecting more than 100,000 people to come out. Folks, if you've never seen miracles, you better get in on this. If you wanted to see blind eyes open, you get in on this. If you want to see deaf ears unstopped and you want to see people that are unable to walk, get up and start moving, get in on this. And so they're putting this together now. So I'm just telling some of the people as I travel because I know they're looking for teams. Some of our young folks, I'm sure, are going to be making their way down there this summer to go on that particular trip. But folks, God is moving. Wonderful things are taking place. We are excited about what God is doing, where God is taking all of us, and where all of you are going. Amen. Oh, my, it puts a smile on my face to see what God is doing here, to hear the testimonies of all of these folks standing up here sharing about what God is doing, meeting God in jail. And I think one of them said they didn't want to go to a church. They thought everybody there was perfect. There is no perfect church. Amen. Everybody in the church is flawed. I mean, goodness, I went to jail the first time when I was eight years of age. Yes. Amen. Churches are filled with troubled people. But thank God he answers prayer. Amen. Now, I'm not going to keep you long, but I'll keep sharing testimonies all day. I can do this and just never run out of things to share. But quickly, let's go to Acts chapter 9. Very quickly, Acts chapter 9, and just a few remarks I want to make regarding the relationship of Barnabas and Saul. Acts chapter 9, verse 27. I've simply titled this, Some Things I Wish I Would Have Known When I First Became a Christian. Acts chapter 9, verse 27, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. Now, Father, for a few moments, just let me share a few remarks as we're celebrating this ninth anniversary with FWC. How remarkable this is, God, that you would build a family here in West Point that could magnify your name and reach out and touch the lives of many people. May it continue to multiply. May their arms reach out into further places in Nebraska and South Dakota and Iowa. And I pray, oh God, that out of this church would go forth men and women that would preach your gospel in the uttermost parts of the earth. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. I think all of us understand that when you become a Christian, you need people in your life to speak into your life. And when you look at Paul's conversion, you can see in chapter 9 that it was fairly dynamic. It was a man that was going to Damascus to arrest people, but he himself was arrested by the presence of God. And in a few moments, God changed his life because it doesn't take long for God to begin to move. And God can do more for you in three or four seconds on your pathway 
than a psychologist, a psychiatrist, or your mom and dad, or anybody else can do for you over a period of several months. But God spoke to him and surrounded him with light. And when he heard the voice of God, he was uncertain about what it all meant. But in the end, he realized that God was calling him to do the work that had been assigned to him before he even had become a Christian. He was unaware of it. Scripture says our life is hid with God in Christ. You don't learn about what God has assigned for you until you become a Christian. So Paul found that there was an old, older saint by the name of Barnabas who took him under his wing to begin to disciple him. And all of us have needed people like that. I've had people like that. When I first became a Christian as a 13 year old, the people that discipled me were 12 year old girls who had been raised in church and knew more about God than I ever did. I was raised as a heathen. I wasn't raised in a church going family. We were in all kinds of trouble. Nobody ever mentioned Jesus name in our house unless they were taking it in vain or inserting a cuss word before it or after it. But because I was chasing after a little girl, I ended up in church with her and it was there in church. I heard the gospel for the first time and my heart was touched and I knew as a kid I was a sinner. Went home, asked my mom if she had a Bible. She said, of course, we've got a Bible in here. Your grandma's Bible is in here. She said, I said, well, you mean to tell me in this house we have a Bible? She said, of course we got a Bible. Then she cussed and she said, what, do you think we're heathen? I said, well, <laughs> yeah. So I took that Bible to my bedroom, got on my knees and became a Christian and they started discipling me. And at every level of my Christian life, I've always had people in my life talking to me. And even to this day, I still have older preachers that are, my spiritual fathers that I can contact and I write to them and we talk on the telephone. They minister to me. Well, this is what Paul needed when he was converted. And Barnabas explained to him the ways of Christianity. Talked to him about the disciples who walked with Christ. Shared with him personal stories that he knew that Saul would not have been aware of. Even though Saul was a persecutor and Saul was a man that did many many evil things. So I think that Paul later in life, when he started preaching and telling folks about the king and writing letters to these people that he had led to the Lord, he used his epistles as an opportunity to impart wisdom, to share understanding with folks about salvation. And I think if, if Paul could summarize a few of his teachings that he has in the epistles, there are several places that I think he would want us to learn. And I think the same with John and James and Peter. But when I look back after serving God now, for as many years as I've been serving God and preaching the gospel since I was a teenager, there are a lot of things I wish people would have told me when I became a Christian. The first is from 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love him, but he loved us first. I wish somebody would have really let me know that the love of God was pursuing me even when I was a sinner. That when I was living a reckless life, when I was living an indifferent life towards God and didn't care about the things of God and was totally consumed with my own desires and my own will, that God himself was still setting me up for me to be saved. Now, of course, some people, it takes them longer. Some people come earlier. But here's the thing. The love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Let's suppose God waited on you for 62 years before you became a Christian. And then you start praying for your family members. And as you're praying for them, you're getting anxious. You're saying, God, I don't understand why you won't move. I don't understand why you're not saving them. I've been praying. I've been fasting. I've had the saints of God pray. And God is sitting back thinking, look, I waited on you 62 years. My love is in your heart. 
you can wait 62 years on somebody else. The beautiful thing is the love of God is pursuing us even when we don't know it's pursuing us. So you gave your testimonies today. You sit here and you think about how wonderful the Lord is right now. But you haven't really meditated on was the fact that before you became a Christian, God was still concerned about you. That when I, as a little eight year old boy, was being handcuffed and taken into jail for vandalism and breaking and entering, that God was in, he was in love with me then. And every time you pulled a needle out or grabbed a bottle and began to drink, God was concerned about you then. He was organizing your steps to cause you to meet certain people, not randomly or coincidentally, but providentially within his plan. So God has something that he's doing. And I wish somebody would have told me that when I was younger. I also wish... In accordance with Colossians chapter one, verse number 14, that says in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. I wish somebody would have told me that when I was redeemed from my sins, I was truly forgiven. You know, there are a whole lot of people that struggle with guilt, condemnation. And they can never get beyond that unless they understand the forgiveness of God. Now, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He does everything he can to continue to point out your flaws, your failures. And just when you're riding high in the grace of God and enjoying yourself, then he'll bring back to your remembrance all the things you've done in the past. And he'll say, look, you hypocrite, slow down. But it's important for you to remember the blood has cleansed me from all iniquity. That you're free. That the past has no power over you. So there's really no reason for you to harbor bitterness and unforgiveness and allow other people to control the strings of your heart like you're a puppet. There are some people who've been dead for decades and there are people that are still alive. When they think of those that have been dead, they still get angry about them. Controlled by somebody that doesn't even live anymore. So we had a minister's conference one time and Dwight Thompson was up preaching and Brother Thompson was telling a story about holding a crusade somewhere. And he said afterwards, a lady came up to him and said, I heard everything you said about love and forgiveness, but I don't buy it. I don't care anything about what you said. He said, well, he's kind of taken off guard by that statement. She said, my husband left me for another woman and left me with these children. I had to raise him. And she said, I drive past the graveyard where he's buried. And every time I get to where his gravestone is, out of my mouth, I shout the most filthy expletives that you can think of because I want him to know exactly how I feel about him. And then I drive off feeling better. The brother Thompson said to her, this is what I think you ought to do. You should go to the nearest Home Depot or maybe go to a Walmart or something and go and buy a shovel and then buy a backpack. And then sometime under the cover of darkness, go out to that graveyard, dig up all of his remains, put it in that backpack, and then strap it to your back and walk around with it. Because he said, as long as he's controlling you like that, that is exactly what you're doing. And if you don't forgive, you'll die a bitter old woman. Scripture says here in Colossians 1, verse number 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. I know I've done wrong. I know you've done wrong. But I don't need to know about what you've done that's under the blood. Because if God would pull back the curtains in here this morning and expose what some of us have done, some of us probably would not even want to be seated next to the person there with you. But the blood eradicates all of that. So what is important now is my present and my future. And I don't have to worry about my past. 
And I preach this all over the world, telling folks that you don't need to be hindered by your past. You can escape the clutches of your past by believing in the blood of Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. Once you've been redeemed, you've been redeemed from the curse. This means that if I'm delivered from guilt and I'm delivered from condemnation and shame, I don't have to worry about the effects of my parents' and grandparents' sins. Now, one of the gentlemen that I preach with overseas, his parents and grandparents on both sides of his families were witches and warlocks. But that has nothing to do with who he is as a Holy Ghost filled preacher. It doesn't matter if your family was filled with alcoholics, bank robbers, cattle rustlers. When you become a Christian, that tie spiritually is severed so that you now, because of regeneration, are taken on the habits and the characteristics of your heavenly father. You don't have to act like your parents acted just because they were divorced 92 times. You don't have to be divorced 92 times. You can take a stand to believe that the blood of Jesus Christ has severed that connection. Now I told one of our churches here not too long ago, there was a graduate student working on a PhD thesis. And she had heard of a family in the Pacific Northwest that had something like, I don't know, 18, 20, 25 generations of people who had been in prison. So she went to investigate. She found an elderly man in his 90s who had spent his time in jail and his children have been in jail and his grandchildren and great grandchildren were in jail. So she was wondering how in the world could this happen and how many generations did this go back? And he didn't know. He just knew that everybody in his family had been in jail. And he told her that when he was a little five or six year old kid, his grandfather walked him outside of their little village to where the state prison was and said to him, son, look at that place right there. That's where I have lived. That's where your great grandfather lived. That's where my grandfather lived. And one day when you grow up, that's where you're going to live. And that's exactly what happened. So that kind of a curse went from one sinful generation in the family to the next one. But I'm here to tell you that when you're redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, there are no generational curses for Christians. Amen. Ephesians chapter one, verse three says we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. You're generationally blessed now. Amen. So rather than focusing on the badness of your past, focus on the goodness of your future and what God is going to do. I've never even understood why people spend their time buying books on how to break generational curses and all of that. Why in the world do you want to pay somebody to teach you that as a Christian you're cursed? When Paul says you're blessed. Absolutely blessed. So I wished when I was a little 13 and 14 year old, somebody would have really explained that to me. Something else. I wish somebody would have explained to me how important the local church is. Everybody ought to have a church family, ought to have a pastor to minister to them, a congregation with whom they can worship. 21 years ago when I came out here to start preaching in South Central Nebraska, it was quite common for me to run into people who didn't go to church anywhere. They just sat at home, watched a video or listened to the radio or something like that and called themselves Christian. But then after they get to talking with me and listening to me, they realize I really wasn't in favor of that. And I'll tell you why. Anybody can be a Christian sitting at home in a lazy boy chair. But you really find out if you love God when you have to be around people that don't agree with you and you don't agree with. You'll find out whether or not you really have a love walk when you can be around people who you find annoying. Come on now. You listening to me? 
It's in the local church that the fertile ground is created for God's word to be sown. And you can see firsthand as people are growing in grace and in knowledge. You can see as children are being raised in faith and hearing the word of God. And you can watch as some of the people are trying to stray and go this way. And you can work to try to bring them back. And you can speak the word of the Lord into their lives. It's in the local church you learn to be a worker. You're not going to learn that sitting at home with three or four people. But in a local church, you're going to learn what it is to get out on the streets and do evangelism. What it is to stand on the back of a flatbed truck and preach the gospel in these small towns. What it is to be encouraged and, and to love people that are passing through difficult times. Look, folks, as much as I believe in and preach divine healing, we got folks in our churches have all kinds of infirmities and illnesses. We have to love them. We're commissioned to love them and to put our arms around them and weep and cry with them. And as much as we preach salvation and believe God wants everybody to be saved, there are family members in our churches that have family members that are not born again. And they weep over their souls and over their sins. And in a local church, you have a bunch of people that can smile. But it's in the church that we learn to do evangelism. And, you know, God uses all kinds of people to do that. So one day a man was taking a trip and he goes and he gets on an airplane. And he comes to his seat and he's got to put his stuff up there in overhead bin. And he looks down, he noticed up against the window, there's a little girl there. It might be 12 or 13 years of age, but he looked at her face and immediately knew she had Down syndrome. And of course, he has the middle seat, so he's not too thrilled about that. And then he doesn't know how she's going to conduct herself during the flight. So sure enough, he gets over there. People are getting on and off and he sits down and you know how it is. You got to try to figure out who the armrest belongs to. And, and so he, he's doing all this. And after about 30 seconds, the, the little girl, she, she looked at him and she said, Mr. Do you brush your teeth? He just kind of looked at her and, why, 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 yeah, I do. She said, that's good. She said, people that brush their teeth won't lose them. <laughs> then she didn't say anything else. After about another 30 seconds, she said, mister, do you smoke? He, he, he said, well, uh, no, I, I don't smoke. She said, well, that, that's good. People who smoke they die. And of course, by now, he's wondering what kind of a flight this is going to be. <laughs> a few more seconds, she said, Mr., do you know Jesus? And he happened to be a Christian, and he said, well, actually, I do. So they went on, had a nice little conversation. People still coming up and down the aisle. Here comes another gentleman. He realizes he's going to be in the aisle. He sees the guy in the middle, sees the lady over here, and he puts his stuff in overhead bin. And then he sits down. And, you know, you, you tell when somebody doesn't want to be bothered. And he just kind of sits down, wants to go to sleep. And so the, the little girl, she, she nudges him, nudges the, the one in the middle and said, said ask him. He said, a ask what? Ask him if he brushes his teeth. <laughs> so the man in the middle <laughs> said to the gentleman, said, excuse me, I, I don't mean to bother you, but a little girl over here is wanting to know if, if, if you brush your teeth. And he kind of leaned forward and looked at her and he said, well, well I do. And she said, well, that's good. That's good. People who brush their teeth, they keep them. And then... She, she nudged him again, said, ask him if he smokes. And sure enough, he said, I, I don't mean to you know, keep bothering you and harassing you, but this little girl up here wants to know if you smoke. And he, he leaned forward. He said, well, actually, I do. She said, that's bad. That's bad. Mama said people that smoke will die. <laughs> and so finally, the little girl nudged the guy in the middle again and said, you know where we're going with this, don't you? Ask him if he knows Jesus. And when he did, the man sitting in the aisle heard that question, do you know Jesus, said his face turned flush red as if he had been caught red-handed doing something. And so 
The little girl nudged the guy in the middle and said, tell him, tell him the story. And he spent the rest of that flight witnessing to that man about Jesus Christ. All of that because of a little girl that had Down syndrome. Folks, don't ever believe God can't use any and everybody whenever he wants to. All it takes is somebody to believe. I wish people would have let me know how important it was to be part of a local church to learn these truths. Yeah. And the last thing I'll give you is this. I wish somebody would have explained to me how important the fruit of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit is. As a young man, I was always attracted to the supernatural. I wanted to know about the power of God, the anointing of God. I wanted to be moved in prophecy and all kinds of different gifts of the Spirit. But way back over there in Galatians, when it talks about love and peace and temperance and faith, the nine fruit of the Spirit, so important in our lives because that is what demonstrates our maturity as a Christian. That's what demonstrates our ability to live in this world that hates God and yet still have patience with people. And the fruit of the Spirit is, is, is something that is amazing because only in the kingdom of God can you have fruit that produces such variety out of one seed. If, if you plant apple seeds, you're only going to get apples to come up. If you plant for a strawberry patch, all you're ever going to get are strawberries. But in the kingdom of God, the seed of the incorruptible word can be sown in your heart, and it'll come up as love, joy, peace, Amen. patience. There's no other fruit on this planet, no other seed on this planet that can produce that. And, and just like with any orchard, you know as well as I do, the trees do not bear the fruit for themselves, but bears the fruit for the ones that walk by and pluck it off the branches and devour it. See? So the fruit of the Spirit is necessary in a local church because when you are manifesting faith, you're manifesting self-control, it's not just for you, it's for your neighbor that's had a bad week. They come into the church. They've been wrestling with the devil all week. They might have lost a job. Somebody cussed them out. They might have had a night before where the kid went to jail. They had to go to jail and visit them. Something terrible happened, and now they're all upset, and they come into this orchard that we call the church. And they get around somebody that's full of the joy of the Lord. And then all of that anger and hostility melts away. Because you know as well as I do which trees have which fruit and you know as well as I do there are certain people you enjoy spending time with because you realize they have a greater giving spirit than others some people are happier than others scripture says the joy of the Lord is our strength he that hath a merry heart has a continual feast so when we come to the house of God we're able to determine by looking at people what kinds of fruits are in manifestation? If I'm having a bad day and I'm depressed, I don't need to be around somebody that's in worse shape than me. I need to find somebody that's going to make me laugh. If you walk up to somebody and they don't have good things to say about some things, go find somebody that does have good things to say. I still think one of the best inventions that's ever come to mankind is the caller ID. <laughs> I believe that, yeah. You know, because when somebody calls, you can look at that number and see that name, and you can ask yourself, do I really feel like dealing with this right now? See? Sometimes it can be ministry. Sometimes it can be a burden. But folks, exhibit the fruit of the Spirit in your life and realize that when you're developing those and manifesting them, it's for your neighbor. Even when you're not having the best day, sometimes your smile is instantly going to make somebody else happy. Sometimes just hearing you laugh. I've got people in my church that I love to get them laughing just because it'll make me laugh hearing them laugh. Yeah. 
And I mean, we just sit around and get tickled. I've got one lady in my church, she'll call me and she'll leave a message on the answer machine if I'm not there. And she gets so tickled while she's talking to the answer machine, she laughs through the whole message. And then I'll sit there, <laughs> Tiffany and I'll hit the button. I say, you know, this is Tina. And, I, and then we'll just go to laugh and listening at her. And then when you're around my folks, they're so encouraging and so happy because they like to be around people that have a good time in God. So happy anniversary, church. Nine years. Praise God. Nine years. We certainly want to encourage you in the King and uh, let you know it's always a joy to come out here. And what a privilege it is to be able to fellowship with the saints of God. But I do think probably we ought to at least pray a prayer over you lovely folks. God only knows what the future is going to hold. And I'm believing God's testimonies are going to multiply from every individual life that's here in this place. And we're believing God his blessing is going to be on you in a greater way. Let's all stand quickly. Pastor, you can come. I'm just going to pray, then I'll give this to you. But I, I need to at least ask this question first, because if there is someone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, we want you to become a Christian. If you're running from God like Jonah ran from God, there's no need to run any further. God is in hot pursuit, and there's nowhere you can go to get away from him. If you're believing God to fill you with the Holy Ghost today, you want him to fill you with the mighty power of the Holy Spirit, speaking with other tongues, as in the book of Acts. There's no reason for you to leave today without God filling you with his mighty Holy Spirit. But we believe God that he can do these things now. But all heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, these are your people. We love you. We honor you right now. We thank you for your touch, your hand that's been upon this congregation from the moment it began. It started, Lord, as a pebble dropped in a pond. But the ripples have gone out in a variety of directions. So, Father, I pray that for every family that calls this place their home, that you would help them to be influencers in the community and that you would bring in a rich harvest of souls. We're praying, God, for public officials that don't know you in the pardon of their sins. We're praying for law enforcement that don't know you in the pardon of their sins. Bring them into contact with people from FWC. I pray, God, that these folks would come and sense the presence of God and then come weeping in the altar, crying out to you, Lord, wanting to be delivered from their sins. I pray, God, throughout the prisons and the jail system that multitudes of people would yet be harvested and brought right into this fellowship. God, bring healing and restoration of health to everyone under the sound of my voice right now. I pray, God, for that one or those two that may be here that may not know you in the pardon of their sins. Father, I pray this message would, would be something that is inescapable for them. They can't run from it, God. Pursue them, Lord, with your love. I pray, O oh God, for that man or woman that's here today been crying out for the mighty baptism of the Holy Ghost. God, you're able to do that even as we're talking right now. Let the mighty power of God fall upon them as it did in Cornelius' home, Lord. God, give them stammering lips. Let them speak with other tongues as the mighty Spirit of God works in their life. Then, Father, we remember Pastor Aaron and Sarah. Thank you, God, for them shepherding this flock. There's so many churches in this region, Lord, that don't have pastors and are crying out for pastors. And yet you provided this church with a pastor that loves you and loves his people. So, God, we're praying special blessings upon them. 